the island of Cuba was inhabited by various Mesoamerican cultures prior to its discovery by the Spanish explorer Christopher Columbus in Indiana 1492. After Columbus's arrival Cuba became a Spanish colony, ruled by a Spanish governor in Havana. In 1762, Havana was briefly occupied by Great Britain, before being returned to Spain in exchange for Florida. A series of rebellions during the 19th century failed to end Spanish rule. However, the Spanish-American War resulted in a Spanish withdrawal from the island in 1898, and Cuba gained formal independence in 1902. In the years following its independence, the Cuban Republic saw significant economic development, but also political corruption and a succession of despotic leaders, culminating in the overthrow of the dictator Fulgencio Batista by the 26th of July movement, led by Fidel and Raul Castro Ruz. During the 1953-9 Cuban Revolution, Cuba has since, update, been governed as a socialist state by the Communist Party under the leadership of the Castro brothers. The country has been politically and economically isolated by the United States since the revolution, but has gradually gained access to foreign commerce and travel as efforts to normalize diplomatic relations have progressed. Domestic economic reforms are also beginning to modernize Cuba's socialist economy. Pre-Columbian history, Cuba's earliest known human inhabitants colonized the island in the 4th millennium BC. The oldest known Cuban archaeological site, La Visa, dates from approximately 3100 BC. A wider distribution of sites date from after 2000 BC, most notably represented by the Cayo Redondo and Guayabo Blanco cultures of western Cuba. These Neolithic cultures utilized ground stone and shell tools and ornaments, including the dagger-like gladiolitos, which are believed to have had a ceremonial role. The Cayo Redondo and Guayabo Blanco cultures lived a subsistence lifestyle based on fishing, hunting and collecting wild plants. Prior to Columbus's arrival, the indigenous Granagetebi, who had inhabited Cuba for centuries, were driven to the far west of the island by the arrival of two subsequent waves of migrants, the Taino and Siboni. These people, sometimes referred to as the Neo-Taino nations, had migrated north along the Caribbean island chain. The Taino and Siboni were part of a cultural group commonly called the Arawak who inhabited parts of northeast and South America prior to the arrival of Europeans. Initially, they settled at the eastern end of Cuba, before expanding westward across the island. The Spanish-Dominican clergyman and writer Bartolomé de las Casas estimated that the Neo-Taino population of Cuba had reached 350,000 by the end of the 15th century. The Taino cultivated the yuca root, harvested it and baked it to produce cassava bread. They also grew cotton and tobacco, and ate maize and sweet potatoes. According to Las Casas, they had everything they needed for living, they had many crops, well arranged. Spanish conquest and early colonization Christopher Columbus, on his first Spanish-sponsored voyage to the Americas in 1492, sailed south from what is now the Bahamas to explore the northeast coast of Cuba and the northern coast of Hispaniola. Columbus, who was searching for a route to India, believed the island to be a peninsula of the Asian mainland. The first sighting of a Spanish ship approaching the island was on 28 October 1492, probably at Barrier I, Holgan Province, on the eastern point of the island. During the second voyage in 1494, Columbus passed along the south coast of the island, landing at various inlets including what was to become Guantanamo Bay. With the Papal Bull of 1493, Pope Alexander VI commanded Spain to conquer, colonize and convert the pagans of the New World to Catholicism. On arrival, Columbus observed the Taino dwellings, describing them as looking like tents in a camp. All were of palm branches, beautifully constructed, 
the Spanish began to create permanent settlements on the island of Hispaniola, east of Cuba, soon after Columbus's arrival in the Caribbean. But the coast of Cuba was not fully mapped until 1509, when Sebastián de Ocampo completed this task. In 1511, Diego Balaz Cestas y Uliacute LLAR set out from Hispaniola to form the first Spanish settlement in Cuba, with orders from Spain to conquer the island. The settlement was at Barraco, but the new settlers were to be greeted with stiff resistance from the local Taino population. The Tainos were initially organized by Cachi Cachui who had himself relocated from Hispaniola to escape the brutalities of Spanish rule on that island. After a prolonged guerrilla campaign, Hatchui and successive chieftains were captured and burnt alive, and within three years the Spanish had gained control of the island. In 1514, a settlement was founded in what was to become Havana. Clergyman Bartolomé de las Casas observed a number of massacres initiated by the invaders as the Spanish swept over the island, notably the massacre near Camagui of the inhabitants of Caunao. According to his account, some 3,000 villagers had traveled to Manzanillo to greet the Spanish with loaves, fishes and other foodstuffs and were, without provocation, butchered. The surviving indigenous groups fled to the mountains or the small surrounding islands before being captured and forced into reservations. One such reservation was Guanabarco, which is today a suburb of Havana. In 1513, Ferdinand II of Aragon issued a decree establishing the Encomienda land settlement system that was to be incorporated throughout the Spanish Americas. Belath Keth, who had become governor of Cuba relocating from Barraco to Santiago de Cuba, was given the task of apportioning both the land and the indigenous peoples to groups throughout the new colony. The scheme was not a success, however, as the natives either succumbed to diseases brought from Spain such as measles and smallpox, or simply refused to work, preferring to slip away into the mountains. Desperate for labor to toil the new agricultural settlements, the conquistadors sought slaves from surrounding islands and the continental mainland. However, these new arrivals followed the indigenous peoples by also dispersing into the wilderness or dying of disease. Despite the difficult relations between the natives and the new Europeans, some cooperation was in evidence. The Spanish were shown by the natives how to nurture tobacco and consume it in the form of cigars. There were also many unions between the largely male Spanish colonists and indigenous women. Modern-day studies have revealed traces of DNA that renders physical traits similar to Amazonian tribes in individuals throughout Cuba. Although the native population was largely destroyed as a culture and civilization after 1550, under the Spanish New Laws of 1552, Cuban Indians were freed from encomienda, and seven Indian towns were set up. There are descendant Cuban Indian families in several places, mostly in eastern Cuba. The Indian community at Carada de los Indios, Guantanamo, is one such nuclei. An association of Indian families in Jiguani, near Santiago, is also active. The local Indian population also left their mark on the language with some 400 Taino terms and place names surviving to the present day. The name of Cuba itself, Havana, Camagui, and many others were derived from the Neo-Taino language, and Indian words such as tobacco, hurricane and canoe were transferred to English and are used today. Arrival of African Slaves the Spanish established curt rice and tobacco as Cuba's primary products, and the island soon supplanted Hispaniola as the prime Spanish base in the Caribbean. Further field labor was required. African slaves were then imported to work the plantations as field labor. However, restrictive Spanish trade laws made it difficult for Cubans to keep up with the 17th and 18th century advances in processing sugarcane pioneered in British Barbados and French Saint-Domingue. Spain also restricted Cuba's access to the slave trade, which was dominated by the British, French, and Dutch. 
One important turning point came in the Seven Years' War, when the British conquered the port of Havana and introduced thousands of slaves in a ten-month period. Another key event was the Haitian Revolution in nearby Saint-Domingue, from 1791 to 1804. Thousands of French refugees, fleeing the slave rebellion in Saint-Domingue, brought slaves and expertise in sugar refining and coffee growing into eastern Cuba in the 1790s and early 19th century. In the 19th century, Cuban sugar plantations became the most important world producer of sugar. Thanks to the expansion of slavery and a relentless focus on improving the island's sugar technology, Cubans were torn between desire for the profits generated by sugar and a repugnance for slavery, which they saw as morally, politically, and racially dangerous to their society. By the end of the 19th century, slavery was abolished. However, prior to the abolition of slavery, Cuba gained great prosperity from its sugar trade. Originally, the Spanish had ordered regulations on trade with Cuba, which kept the island from becoming a dominant sugar producer. The Spanish were interested in keeping their trade routes and slave trade routes protected. Nevertheless, Cuba's vast size and abundance of natural resources made it an ideal place for becoming a booming sugar producer. When Spain opened the Cuban trade ports, it quickly became a popular place. New technology allowed a much more effective and efficient means of producing sugar. They began to use water mills, enclosed furnaces, and steam engines to produce higher quality sugar at a much more efficient pace than elsewhere in the Caribbean. The boom in Cuba's sugar industry in the 19th century made it necessary for the country to improve its transportation infrastructure. Planters needed safe and efficient ways to transport the sugar from the plantations to the ports in order to maximize their returns. Many new roads were built, and old roads were quickly repaired. Railroads were built relatively early, easing the collection and transportation of perishable sugar cane. It was now possible for plantations all over this large island to have their sugar shipped quickly and easily. Sugar plantations Cuba failed to prosper before the 1760s due to Spanish trade regulations. Spain had set up a trade monopoly in the Caribbean, and their primary objective was to protect this, which they did by barring the islands from trading with any foreign ships. The resultant stagnation of economic growth was particularly pronounced in Cuba because of its great strategic importance in the Caribbean, and the stranglehold that Spain kept on it as a result. As soon as Spain opened Cuba's ports up to foreign ships, a great sugar boom began that lasted until the 1880s. The island was perfect for growing sugar, being dominated by rolling plains, with rich soil and adequate rainfall. By 1860, Cuba was devoted to growing sugar, having to import all other necessary goods. Cuba was particularly dependent on the United States, which bought 82% of its sugar. In 1820, Spain abolished the slave trade, hurting the Cuban economy even more and forcing planters to buy more expensive, illegal, and troublesome slaves. The 16th-18th centuries, Cuba under attack. Colonial Cuba was a frequent target of buccaneers, pirates and French corsairs seeking Spain's new world riches. In response to repeated raids, defenses were bolstered throughout the island during the 16th century. In Havana, the fortress of Castillo de los Tres Reyes Magos del Moro was built to deter potential invaders, which included the English privateer Francis Drake, who sailed within sight of Havana Harbor but did not disembark on the island. Havana's inability to resist invaders was dramatically exposed in 1628 when a Dutch fleet led by Piet Hain plundered the Spanish ships in the city's harbour. 
In 1662, English admiral and pirate Christopher Mimes captured and briefly occupied Santiago de Cuba on the eastern part of the island, in an effort to open up Cuba's protected trade with neighboring Jamaica. Nearly a century later, the English were to invade in earnest, taking Guantanamo Bay in 1741 during the War of Jenkins' Ear with Spain. Edward Vernon, the British admiral who devised the scheme, saw his 4,000 occupying troops capitulate to local guerrilla resistance and more critically, an epidemic, forcing him to withdraw his fleet to British-owned Jamaica. In the War of the Austrian Succession, the British carried out unsuccessful attacks against Santiago de Cuba in 1741 and again in 1748. Additionally, a skirmish between British and Spanish naval squadrons occurred near Havana in 1748. The Seven Years' War, which erupted in 1754 across three continents, eventually arrived in the Spanish Caribbean. Spain's alliance with the French pitched them into direct conflict with the British, and in 1762 a British expedition of five warships and 4,000 troops set out from Portsmouth to capture Cuba. The British arrived on 6 June, and by August had Havana under siege. When Havana surrendered, the admiral of the British fleet, George Keppel, the third Earl of Albemarle, entered the city as a conquering new governor and took control of the whole western part of the island. The arrival of the British immediately opened up trade with their North American and Caribbean colonies, causing a rapid transformation of Cuban society. Food, horses and other goods flooded into the city, and thousands of slaves from West Africa were transported to the island to work on the undermanned sugar plantations. Though Havana, which had become the third largest city in the Americas, was to enter an era of sustained development and closening ties with North America during this period, the British occupation of the city proved short-lived. Pressure from London sugar merchants fearing a decline in sugar prices forced a series of negotiations with the Spanish over colonial territories. Less than a year after Havana was seized, the Peace of Paris was signed by the three warring powers, ending the Seven Years' War. The treaty gave Britain Florida in exchange for Cuba on the recommendation of the French who advised that declining the offer could result in Spain losing Mexico and much of the South American mainland to the British. This led to disappointment in Britain, as many believed that Florida was a poor return for Cuba and Britain's other gains in the war.